Okay, so Whiteman and Fleming, basically, we began in 1985 in Leeds, um, founded by Elaine Whitewood and myself, and we're also married, which kids always ask, so I thought I'd let you know. Um, and we direct the company, we create most of the ideas in consultation with all our teams and all our participants. Um, and I guess we worked in Yorkshire for many, many years, and, and then we moved across to Cumbria in 2000, somewhere around there. And we've been working as an, we are now an MPO of Arts Council in the Northwest and have been since MPO started. So whatever, about six years. Uh, so nowadays there are two of us that direct the company, um, a, a part-time fundraiser, a part-time projects coordinator, and a, a pool of, a freelance pool of about 12, I call them hand-picked, highly trained artists who we've worked with for many years and who we develop. And on top of that, there are what we then call NGAs, which are next generation artists who are the 20 somethings who are just graduating, who work with us. And we hope they will go on to become fully trained artists, then lead artists. So we have a sort of combination of, of lead artists who are freelancers, but who work to what <coughs> we rather arrogantly call the Whitewood and Fleming ethos. And that's only because uh, I, we like to know that if, if our team go in a room, they're working the way we like it to be, because that's what we like. So if you like that ethos, you carry on working with us, and if you don't, you, you don't, I suppose. But we kind of want to work with a, a, a team of really highly trained people to produce the best outcomes for, these, for the kids we work with, because it's not easy work. It falls apart regularly. I mean, you know, I could fill the room with stories of things falling apart and kids not turning up and, and, and artists coming to me saying, I'm useless, I can't do it anymore. That's, that's the territory. So, so it's, it takes a certain kind of person. And it's not everybody's cup of tea. That's fine. So they, you know, they move on and they work for all the other different people. But this is our area of interest, working with young people who are looked after. And, and hard to reach is a kind of odd expression for these young people because they're almost impossible to reach in some ways. Um, but I would say they're easy to reach. You just have to unpick it. You just have to find out where they are, find out how you get there and find out how you work with them when you do get there and then find out what's wrong and why it's not working. It's just an endless... You know those dolls that smile all the time, you go boof like that, and they, they, they probably don't exist anymore. Do you know the ones I mean? And they bounce back and they come up smiling, and they go boof again, and they go down again. That's, that's, a kind of, that's what we do. It doesn't matter what you do, you can slam doors in our faces all the time, and all we do is open another one. That's the thing I constantly say. If, if anybody slams a door in your face, whether it's children's services or a young person, whoever it is, just open another one. It's all you just keep going. Well, what about this? What about this idea? What about this? What about this funding stream? What about this way of working? So yeah, looked after children is our principal target group, and that the whole the whole um, from uh, profound multiple learning difficulties, special needs, right through to um, okay, I will say challenging behaviour, but I'll tell you why I hate that expression later on. To extremely challenging behaviour, young people who exhibit those sorts of things, but I, I don't use that expression at all really. Um, we work in Cumbria, we've worked in partnership with Children's Services. We're used to negotiating and creating projects with the senior management of something like a Children's Services so that we can try and convince them of the value of the work and try and head towards a service level agreement or some kind of contract. So we ran a service level agreement for Children's Services in Calderdale for nine years because once we'd proved the outcomes, once we'd proved what we could do with young people, they kind of came to us and said, this has got to carry on, what do we do? So for nine years we uh, ran a service level agreement there. We then started a sister organisation who are still delivering six years later the same service level agreement in Halifax called Wise Up Arts, who I thoroughly recommend. Uh, when we got to Cumbria we did the same thing, ran a service level agreement for two years and then of course the economic climate changed and we don't have that anymore. Um, but we are still delivering a programme um, thanks to independent fundraising that we do and then we take to children's services. So currently we are delivering a programme with foster carers in partnership with the National Children's Bureau and CCE. Creative, I always get this wrong, Creative Culture Education? I, oh, fantastic. I, always, I don't know why I can't remember that. But, um, and that's a project with foster carers and with young people. So the reason we work with looked after children, one of the main reasons we work with looked after children is we, want, we think we want to give them a voice. We want to find a way that they can speak for themselves using their own creativity. And we have an expression we call finding the key to these young people. All young people 
have a key, you have a key, you have your own interests. And we basically um, will work with, this, with some artists and with some equipment and all the different things we have and watching a young person until they're we find a spark, something they're really, really interested in and then notice that and then just start to build on that and work on it. And that's our way into a young person. And that spark is really important because that's how they start to engage in our creative process. And I just want to start, I'm going to show you this film now because I'd like the, the voices of the young people in the room. And the, the story of this young person is she's 15, she's from Kendall. And um, when she first came to us, it was for a singing project in Kendall in a respite centre. And she stayed in the kitchen, she wouldn't come in the room at all. And she's very, very shy. And her foster carer said, I'll just bring her there once and um, we'll see what happens. She probably won't come again. Well, we managed to get her through the door and we managed to carry on working with her. She came to every single week, every single week, and she ended up um, being very confident, increasing in self-confidence, self-esteem, all those sorts of things, and starting to lead the warm-up sessions at the beginning of the workshops. And then she came to us and said she wanted to start to explore ways that she could speak to people more and tell, tell people her own story a bit more. And as luck would have it, we were approached by the BBC because they were working on EastEnders. Uh, there's a website called E20, uh, which uh, is part of the EastEnders thing. And it's to do with, with young people accessing the stories of the young people in EastEnders. And there was a kid in care in EastEnders in a children's home. And the BBC came to us and said, we somehow want to get the voice of a young person into our, onto our website so that kids, when they click on, they, and there's 10,000 hits a week, can actually find out what it's like to be in care. How do we do that? Now, you might imagine, I can't show you anybody, really. I can't show anybody that in, a, in a public situation a, a young person in care because they're, they're protected. It's confidential information. So we worked with the young person and, and an animator to create her story so she could explain to people what it was like being in care at 15. And now this, this is on the EastEnders website, the E20 website. You can, you can see it if you want. It's on our website. And um, as I say, it's watched by about 10,000 people a week, something like that. What I want to introduce to you is, is the kind of the ethos of the way we work, which to us is really, really important. Um, and we've never really given it a name until about five years ago. We just knew we worked a particularly instinctive way, because I'm not trained in working with looked after children. I have, I have a lifetime's experience of working with people with special needs and profound learning difficulties. So I just kind of brought that to working with looked after kids. But I didn't understand what I was doing for, for many years. We just kind of started to create an ethos. We need to do this. Maybe you need to do that. Uh, but about five years ago, um, Professor Petrie, Professor Pat Petrie from the Institute of Education in London came to us on a project we were working with the Children's Bureau and she said to us, I, I really want to, to explore what you're doing more because I think you are pedagogues. And I hadn't really heard this word before and I don't think it's a word we know in our country. Uh, and I'm, I think it's a kind of cultural thing from a long time ago basically to do with translation of words. But uh, she introduced the fact that the concept of social pedagogues. Now, if you're European, if you're French or German or Swedish or Danish, you understand what a pedagogue is. I didn't know. And uh, within about a day of talking to Pat and researching with Pat, I kind of thought, this is absolutely amazing. Why don't we know about this in our country? And to cut a very long story short, if you're a looked after child <coughs> in Denmark, you have a social worker, um, you have children's services people working with you, but you also have a social pedagogue who works with you every day for maybe 10 years. Now, yeah, literally 10 years or, or, or longer if that's what it, and they work with you, they work with your family, but one third of their, of their time can be, must be a creative arts activity of your own choosing. And you're trained to double degree level to do that with looked after children. So if it's photography, that's what you use. If it's um, textiles, that's what you use. If it's music, that's what you use. And you study that through university, through two degrees, and then you're allowed to work with looked after children. And that's what, that's what the people expect to deliver to their children, in, in Denmark in particular. Now I know more about Denmark because since then I've been and done a lot of research in Copenhagen with the university, with the people who are delivering the social pedagogue training courses and in residential units. And the outcomes for looked after children in Denmark are phenomenal. The teenage pregnancy rate in Denmark is zero. Zero. And the teenage pregnancy rate in a children's home I've just worked in in, in uh, North Cumbria was 99%, probably 100% by now, actually. Um, that 40% of looked after children go to university. 
Now, I'm not sure what it is in this country, but I think it's less than 1%. So that's just not good enough, I don't think. And so that set us down a whole way of thinking about researching with Professor Petrie about what it means to be an artist pedagogue. And I, I could talk for a couple of hours about that, and I would love to, but they won't let me. Um, <laughs> but if, if you want to find out more, do, do talk to me or do talk to, to come, and, come and see us or anything like that. But it's, it's, not, it's not rocket science. It's not a complicated <coughs> way to work. It's just straightforward. And uh, an example I would perhaps give you, if, if I've got time, is... Um, like a working day for us, running a workshop with some young people who are coming. Um, there'll be a team of four of us, plus a children's services worker who is part of our creative team. They've been to all the training that we've provided. All those artists are highly trained. They've had three, four, five days intensive training before they meet a looked after young person. Um, a workshop's going to start, but two hours before that, the team will meet and they'll discuss strategy. They'll discuss what the workshop's going to entail. They'll discuss who's going to work with who, what's going to happen if this happens, what's going to happen if that happens, who's the safeguarding people, who re whose relationships work with which person. They're going to look at every single detail. If everything goes wrong, you two guys are going to stay, you two guys are going to go. So we know everything that's going to, that might happen in that workshop. Um, that, that has NGAs in it, it's that which are our young apprentices, if you like. It has children's services. It has a highly trained um, lead artist and sometimes a director and trained artists. We do the workshop for two, three, four, five hours. The longer, the better from our point of view, because the, you can, the more fun you can have. You can eat, you can go for walks, you can do all sorts of things that, these young, that young people might need. You can stop and say, oh, you're really tired. I'm really tired. Let's go get some chips or um, let's go to the park or... You know, let's just do something else. So a four-hour workshop's great for that, or a five-hour workshop. That finishes, and this, the team sit down, and they go through every detail. Is everybody OK? I'm really worried about this person. Does anybody know anything? We, can we find out something about this young person and why they're under the table banging their head for next week? Or that child's... I had this quite recently. That child is great for 20 minutes. After 20 minutes, he's nearly suicidal. What are we doing wrong? Are we, what are we doing? You know, are we are we doing permanent damage to this young child? Can social service, can children's services please get us a report for next week? Then we'll analyse that, and we do that every single week for 16 weeks, so that everybody's learning, everybody's growing, and the young people are growing with you. Does that make sense? That, I mean, that's absolutely key to what we do. And so for our artists, yes, you're an artist, yes, you're a musician, but every single person in that room who's a Whitewood and Fleming artist, is a blooming brilliant person that I would love to spend some great time with. And I, I, I want them to give everything they can to, for, those, for those children. And they want to do that too. So it might mean they're a brilliant, um, charismatic singer, or it might mean they're a really quiet techie who likes to tap on the computer and make, make animation. Because some kids will go to him and not the big charismatic superwoman, whoever it is, doesn't matter. So you need all those different kinds of people. Every one of them is a rock-solid human being who know who can say, let's just stop. Come on, it's not, it's not working, is it? What am I doing wrong? Have the confidence to do that. That's vitally important because the young people we work with are miles ahead of us. They, they know if, you, if, you're, if it's falling apart. They know if, it's, they know if they're rattling your buttons. Do you rattle buttons? Rattle bells? What is it you rattle your leg, your cage. They know if they're rattling your cage. And because they do that with, with adults all the time. How long is it until you, you tell, tell me I can't come anymore? How long is it till you get cross? Well, why should I get cross? This, this young person I might know, or I might not know, has had extreme trauma since they were three months old. I can be nice to them for a few hours. It's not hard. You know, I can learn to be patient. I can, I can therapise myself with my colleagues at the end of that session. And kids do that. They're, I mean, I, it happens to me all the time. Kids come to me and they seem to go, he's the one I'm going to wind up. And it just, they just, ooh, you know, they just, you start to get cross and you have to think, I'm not going to get cross. Why would I want to get cross? I'm going to, I'll talk about it later. I'll see if somebody would, else would like to take care of this young person. But anyway, I'm, I'm going on to too much detail now. Um, but one of the crucial things there is a thing called a common third. Okay? Now, to me, this is quite important because I love, I love music and I love making films and I love working with people. So I, I am going to work with you, young person, looked after person, but what our passion is, is music. And that's what we have in common. Because I found your little key. That is what we have in common. So that's what we talk about. We can talk about all sorts of things. The football, you know, what was on telly last night. But I'm going to keep coming back to that tune, because I love that. 
and that's where we're going to go together. And if it's a little rap piece, we'll, whatever it is, you know, hip hop, what, folk music, whatever, um, eventually we'll make a tune. What do you do with the tune? Stick it on your phone as a ringtone. How, do you, how are you going to tell your friends it's yours? You're going to have to speak on it, or you're going to have to write some lyrics. Or oh, you've got a tune, let's make a film. What do you do with the film? You screen a film, you have a party. See where I'm going? You're off. You find one key, you're off. And that's kind of, to me, that's crucial. And we've done a lot of research on this in the past five years with Professor Petrie. Uh, I can recommend you some books that she's written on, on social pedagogy. She's the European expert on social pedagogues, really. Um, how else do we know this works? We monitor and evaluate constantly, every single day, every single day with our young people, with our teams. Uh, we're developing a theory of change model through a recent project with the Have A Go project with the foster carers and the children, with OPM, who are a, a, a London evaluation company, and the National Children's Bureau. Um, we've invented a 12 stages of musical progression for a new project. Uh, we, we deliver arts <coughs> awards, bronze up to gold. We've just got 23 young people through the Discover Arts Award, which has just in, been invented. Um, I'm trying to get more people interested in these pedagogical ideas. So we've started to work a little more strategically, which I can't go into, but we have decided to try and work on the ground in Cumbria, but we're also now delivering a programme for youth music in the Midlands with Sandwell Children's Services. We're just about to start in Liverpool with Liverpool Children's Services. And I'm also talking to Oxford and Dudley Children's Services about this pedagogical way of working and starting to deliver it and train children's services staff in the same techniques and artists and then leave those teams behind so that Sandwell in two years time will have a team of trained musical pedagogues who can deliver that work and that to me is starting to be really important because in Cumbria the cuts have completely decimated children's services and I mean decimated 300 staff made redundant a third of all senior managers now doing four jobs um, last year um, they've, this year now, between now and March, they still have to lose another million pounds. Result, they fail their Ofsted on safeguarding looked after children. The children right at the edge. And there are 60,000 of these young people in this country. And they're all, Doncaster Children's Services also fail. Dudley Children's Services fail. All on safeguarding, all because of the cuts. What does Michael Gove say? Put more children in care. How do we do that, Michael Gove, when you've just cut all the children's services? Well, um, you know, it, it costs £7,000 a week, a minimum, to keep a child in care. So uh, these children are being let down. You know, children's homes have not changed for 25 years, and that stinks. I work in children's homes all the time, and they're as bad as they always were. I think we need to take the lead. I really, I really do. I think, you know, let's not get depressed that children's services are, are getting cut and they haven't got any money. Let's not get depressed about that. Let's find a way around it and let's start to do something about it. And that's what we are trying to do. So we are now raising money and take, it's really hard and taking it to them and saying, here is a radical innovative programme. Do you want to join in? You know, Sandwell Children's Services, they're fantastic people. I just did a presentation to 120 of them and they're wonderful people, but they've got no money but they've got brilliant heart, they've got enthusiasm, they've got interest. Sanwell could take itself to be one of the most radical thinking children's services in the country if they start to work on this idea. Now, that's what we should be doing as radical artists, coming up with ideas and giving them to people to start bringing about systemic change, because that's what's important to me. OK, um, I'm sorry I'm lecturing you now, but I, I was told I could, so I am going to. I don't often get the chance. Um, we all know arts are transformative. We see it every day. I saw it in Laura's little film there. Um, but I, I don't think we should be followers of trends anymore. I think too many people, me included, you know, um, follow a grant trend. There's some funding. Let's, let's have a project to suit that funding. Let's start to try and drive the agenda the other way. We used to be able to, 25 years ago, you could come up with a great idea, find the money, start to change policy. Um, I think we should do that again. Children's services consider themselves failing organisations. Well, let's start to try and help them. Let's start to lead. Let's get behind the table with those people and, um, you know, use our lateral thinking, resourcefulness, creativity to, to make these systemic changes possible. OK, um, we create agendas, we try and create agendas by coming up with new radical ideas and then just give them to people. And like the Sing Up Beyond the Mainstream programme, their, laugh, their final year was entirely given half a million pounds to look after children. That's because we created a little £18,000 model which they then took and rolled out across the country. It's possible to do. It is possible and we should be doing that. We shouldn't just be doing sticking plaster stuff. You know what I mean by sticking plaster stuff? It's the kind of phrase people use, isn't it? You can keep, you can keep doing art for, for young people all the time, but I, I don't think that's enough anymore. Run a local programme, 
run strategic work and do some deep thinking about systemic change. That's, what, that's where I'm at and that's where our company are at. Um, delivery is no longer enough, even brilliant delivery, okay? Challenging behaviour, challenging behaviour, <laughs> this term must be scrapped completely, right? If, if you're told you're going into a room with somebody who is challenging, what do you do? Oh my God, challenge, if I said to the team, you've got some really challenging kids in there, you're going to go in in a state of near panic. Well, that's just awful. Because these children, let's not call them that anymore. Let's call them vulnerable young people. If I walk into a room and someone's vulnerable, how am I going to be? This person's vulnerable. You know, what's happened to this child? They're vulnerable. They're traumatised. I've done a lot of research on extreme trauma in the brain. It takes 50 years to come out. It, a shadow, anything, you know, a colour purple can bring it back to some people. These children are vulnerable and traumatised. So we should be doing everything we can to give them the best possible experience because there's 60,000 of them swept under the carpet in the country. And you can't just say, let's take more kids in care and, get, and, and ignore them. You can't do that. And I have spent 30 years shouting that, but, you know, it's not changing quickly enough. And I'm going to say one more thing. Um, I'm working with some multidimensional treatment foster workers in, in the Midlands. And one of them said to me the other day in an interview, these are not children with problems, these are children with potential. <laughs>